Uh, our, the next topic is uh, safety assessment by trained professionals experience. So uh, please join me in welcoming Butch Grime. Thank you. Uh, I know I'm the first guy after the meal, so if you fall asleep, please not don't snore. Uh, let's see. A little background into this. I uh, a few years ago, I was I'm a member of the 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 Council of American Institute of Architects members in, in the state of Alabama. And uh, counselors are expected to take on some committee or some, some project. And the committee I took on was uh, safety assessments and, and disaster uh, uh, assistance in the state of Alabama, which seemed at the time like a good, good thing I wouldn't have to do very much. And, and for two or three years, we did a lot of uh, training um, we, we use uh, advanced technology uh, councils training program, which is ATC 45 and ATC 20, which uh, wind and water damage and, and earthquake damage. And we trained over the maybe three years um, about 40 architects and engineers. And uh, when, when this uh, event came along on, on the 27th of April, uh, it was obvious that uh, uh, our three dozen people weren't going to be anywhere close to being able to do any damage assessment at the point that, that we needed to, to, to handle it. Another thing that, uh, that we had worked on for quite a while and finally gotten some work on is a Good Samaritan law. Alabama did not have a Good Samaritan law until 2006 and even, even then it was very limited. Um, the way it is set up, uh, you, it, it's specific to a disaster situation, and uh, and there. Well, we'll get into that a little little deeper. Um, the um, so this was our biggest event, as as it's been from almost everyone else. Uh, and so I'm going to go over the, the Good Samaritan Law, working with the EMAs, uh, how we did our evaluations of structures, things we learned. And then, and then questions. And now, if anyone has a question, raise your hand. Since we're recording, they've asked us. If you have a question, you, you could come up to the microphone and, and state your question, or I'll repeat it for you if you need it. Um, what's the role of architects in disaster? Um, we usually, you, when you think about it, well, you know, we're supposed to be out there or back in the office drawing, but quite often we're in the field inspecting buildings all the time. And if you go to some construction sites, you, you'll realize that they look like disaster scenes to begin with. Uh, it's usually, a, it's, a, it's a mess. Um, this uh, business of providing public assistance came when uh, our national component in Washington decided that we needed to be proactive and help in designing communities and helping communities put together better planning and, and better design in general. And so communities by design had a subcategory which was disaster assistance. When April 27th came, the test task force uh, in Washington was working on putting together some people to go to Japan and to, to provide assistance and, and um, whatever engineering or architectural help that, that we could provide. Um, the reason we say architects are involved in this is because we have the skills. We're quite often the people who design the buildings that you're walking across or looking down at. Um, and it's, uh, we, we, like you, are dealing with the public on most every, every front. We are multidisciplinary. Uh, I guess the word means that we keep our finger in every pie. We don't know everything about everything, but we know a little bit uh, about it, so we know the contact people and the words to speak. And lots of times we have visions of, of what can, can be done uh, for future improvement to the community simply because we've seen this happen in other places. And we're community adv advocates because we live here. And in, and in the case of Tuscaloosa, I live here about uh, eight blocks from here and about five blocks from the path of the storm. Um, this is our this is a little timeline to sort of ex explain what normally happens when you have a disaster, which is, and that's, 
let me back up and say, you never know what's going to happen because the de definition of a disaster is something that, that you, you didn't plan for. But hopefully, um, we'll see, normally we'll see search and rescue and the utility companies come in. And I want to say it again, the Alabama Power Company has done, been there and done that, but boy, they were good this time. I've never seen, seen them do a better job than they did around here. They hit the ground running and in some cases, they would have been, it would have been easier to go out through a cow pasture and build a new line. They had to make a path and haul, out, haul off their old substations to, to build and put back, and, and they did a great job. Um, I can, just a quick thought, uh, the gas company had a, had a major job, and Allen's people helped them a lot by turning off natural gas. Uh, for the first few few days, you'd be walking around in all of that mess, and uh, you could smell natural gas, and you knew that some of, somebody was going to crank a chainsaw, and, and we were going to blow up. Thank goodness it didn't happen, but uh, it, it was a, a big mess. And then safety assessments, that's the green bar. Uh, we don't come in at the same time that, that search and rescue does, because we're just really not needed for that. But what we're trying to do is help assess the situation so that Allen or any building official knows what's going on, has a better count of what's happening. And, and we also are going in there to protect the public. So we're going to put up placards and, and signs that say, don't go here. Or if you go here, be careful. Or, and we are just trying to, trying to help things out. Um, Another area where we help is in recovery, and that's in master planning. That comes weeks afterwards, and my part has been very, very limited in that, but uh, it, it can be very important to the community. Um, this is our mission statement. I don't think I need to read all this to you, but um, the AIA's comprehensive response system is meant to channel our abilities, the architect's uh, abilities to prevent uh, to preventive design and organize response to disaster and recovery. Well, <clears throat> that means preventive design means let's get, let's get together and figure out what a good building ought to be before we put it through an earthquake or a tornado or a flood. Um, this is our basic setup. Uh, our national task force is run by the director of the AIA, who is Robert Ivey. As it turns out, Robert's from Columbus, Mississippi, so he's been helpful for us. He, he, he knows the, the territory. Um, I'm the Alabama coordinator. There's another coordinator in Georgia, another one in Florida, another one in Mississippi that I deal with. And each of us is connected to team leaders in each area. That You have Huntsville, Birmingham, Montgomery, uh, all those, um, those areas have people who will work in, in their particular area if there's, a, if there's an event. And in other words, let's say since I'm state coordinator, if Tuscaloosa hopefully is never hit by anything like this and I'm not available, I can't, I, I, I can't do anything, there'll still be people who know how. We're, we're not bottlenecked with those, those kinds of things. Uh, trained volunteers, right now we're in pretty good shape. We have volunteers trained for Alabama, about 150, uh, re able and ready to go uh, to, to another disaster similar to this one. Florida offered us 350, Mississippi said they might get us 150, and I, we, caught, we, we made a decision that we would go ahead and do our training at the same, at the, uh, on the site, at, at the time of, of, the, of our disaster here because with, uh, with three dozen people, we needed more anyway. And the other thing is we didn't know where we'd put 300 people from Florida. So hopefully that won't be, in, be a, a problem, but it could be. Um, Good Samaritan Law, this is, this is the text of it. Now again, I won't read that to you. But uh, it's, the state of Alabama has uh, been very slow to, to adopt it. It took, took years working with the, with the legislature to get it to happen. Um, the, the salient points are, if you're a, a, a professional person, architect, surveyor, contractor with experience, um, a, a public official like a building inspector or a, uh, the, um, or a fire marshal, 
then you know buildings and therefore you can be certified to do inspections of those buildings. Um, if you do that, you could be sued. So the state says you're, you're free of lawsuits so long as you, uh, let's see, work under a, 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 an authority. In my case, I worked under Allen uh, for the Tuscaloosa uh, Building Department. You can't just go out there and show up with, with hat and boots. Uh, you, you have to be in an organized situation. All of the work that, that's done for, for that's, that's covered by um, the, the Good Samaritan Law has to happen within 90 days of the, um, of the event. So, uh, and in, at the time that this happened, we, we actually got, got this extended to 90 days, uh, but at the, uh, the April 27th event, uh, had a 30-day limit on it and there was nothing that anybody could do about that the governor doesn't have the power to extend it so um, we basically had uh, 30 in fact I did 12 inspections on on the 30th day um, and of course the last line is you need to act responsibly no matter how much Good Samaritan uh, effect it, there is if you don't act responsibly, you, you need to use good, good sense in, in what you're doing. Okay, um, in my case, in trying to train all these people, I've been working with a local Tuscaloosa EMA director, and he uh, and I knew each other, and, I, and, and he knew what we were gonna be able to provide. So um, I went over to the, um, well, I tried to get over to the EMA office, but of course it had been blown away. It was the first big building to go when the when town, when, when we were hit. So uh, I found him at the football stadium in a, in a room up under the bleachers. And he waved at me, but he was busy. So I went back the next day and they had moved him to another place. I left a message for him and then he sent me a message back saying, I know what you're going to do for us and I want to talk to you, but until the president leaves the town, I can't do anything. So, and that's, that's one of those things you don't think about, but if the president comes, not much else happens. Uh, this is kind of the way things looked, and, and this is, uh, everybody has seen these pictures. This is a, you know, just a neighborhood shot um, of, of the kind of things that people crawled out, out, out of their homes and, and saw. So everybody is in shock and they're looking at this, this kind of stuff. And then a strange thing happens, you get sightseers. I wish I had a picture of the lady with three dogs. She was walking the dogs, taking pictures, it was kind of, well, it was surreal. Uh, it was, it was kind of like a carnival type thing. And there were holes in the ground where trees had been that you could put two cars in, and people were walking right by them, around them. Uh, there were houses hanging over uh, and ready to fall. Um, and there's nobody in control. It's totally chaotic. And so that was what brought on the idea of having damage and, and safety assessments. Um, we form our teams with professionals. Um, and, and the reason is we train people how to, how to do these tests, how to do these, um, these surveys, but we don't train you to, be a, to, to have the good judgment that, you, that you're gonna need. You, you really have to have experience and training. And that's why we, we limit the people that, that do this work to architects, engineers, public officials. Uh, one of the things that, that helped, uh, I guess, to the, the school, the, uh, the city here, is that uh, they were working with FEMA, and FEMA uh, requires a, a, an in-kind contribution to, uh, to, uh, to cover some of the expenses. And our expenses, our hourly rates are pretty high. Everybody complains about that, but uh, if that's what you get. Anyway, uh, with, with, at the end of our, oh, let's see, week, week and a half of work, we had amassed about uh, $200,000, $250,000 worth of free time that the city could use as in-kind services to help pay for part of the FEMA expenses. And, and uh, hopefully that'll, that'll come in handy for the city. They spent a lot of money around, around here. Um, 
we trained our people to be to be uh, consistent evaluators, and, and I'll show you that a little further. But the the idea is that if we're reviewing a building in Tuscaloosa, it should be reviewed the same way here as if it was in Maine, California, Texas, Kansas, wherever. And uh, so that a lot of this data that we've talked about this morning gets compared properly. Um, and one of the good things about this is that uh, the architects that are involved, and a lot of the architects that were involved in this, uh, and engineers, are also the architects and engineers that are working to put these buildings back. So they are going to be aware of, of a lot of the problems that uh, like we've talked about again today, the roofs blowing off at the wrong times. Um, the guidelines we use. We use this, this is a checklist and you can't see it, but uh, as you can imagine, green at the bottom means it's not much damage. Uh, yellow in the larger section is some damage, uh, but uh, still quite habitable. Orange is a category that we've talked about uh, after, after our event here. We would, we, when we did this sur survey, we used yellow and no orange. But, um, but when you pass 50% of damage to the structure, we feel that's, that's important to the building official and, and to the people who are, who are involved. And then of course red means this is a hazardous area and you don't need to be staying there. Now, we did have some, and Alan mentioned this earlier, we had some people who called in and said they put a, a red sticker on the front of my building, I can't go in. It doesn't mean you can't go in, it just means that it's, it's a dangerous situation and you need to be very cautious. Uh, it, and it's primarily to keep the sightseers out. Uh, the, the people who are walking through the building taking pictures, uh, not noticing that there's a beam over their head that's not supported. Um, so we put these placards all around. This is the, the red one, enter at your own risk, but do not occupy. That's, uh, that's our highest level, and that's the, uh, we, we, we put a lot of those out, tell you the truth. Uh, now, we had one, one situation where we had some, some fire marshals working together, and they, kept, they were looking at some buildings, and they said, well, these buildings don't have sprinklers in them, so they must not be adequate. So they started putting red, red stickers on them. And actually, <laughs> I, I couldn't argue with them a lot. But on the other hand, uh, it was a little bit rough on the lady that lived there. So uh, we had to back up and, and make some changes. Um, these are quick illustrations of buildings. Uh, buildings off foundations, totally d demolished. It, it's not hard to put a red placard on a concrete slab. Uh, but you know, one of the things we had to be careful of, and we carried some red tape, is to uh, to put red tape around the swimming pools. Uh, it seems like the water got sucked out of all the swimming pools, but you can still fall in it. And people will wander around, and there's not a whole lot of street lights left in those situations. Um, this is a, a red tag. This one was, um, was a church in Phil Campbell. Um, it... Uh, I put it in here because so, I wanted to show you something which seems like everybody else has noticed too. I don't know if you can see it very well, but in, um, in here there's, in the pews, there are lots and lots of pieces of brick from the brick veneer. I couldn't find, I couldn't find a single brick tie in, in that one. Uh, it looked good. This is, uh, this is back in Tuscaloosa. This is a, uh, a building that lost its roof, as, as we said. It's gable end, and obviously one of the gables blew out. I happen to have these pictures because uh, one of our employees lived downstairs, uh, down in there. Uh, let's see, this is our orange, 70 to 50%. This is our this is our recommendation because we're we're sending this back to AIA National and saying that we don't have enough enough categories for for these things. You can live in this building, but there may be a blocked entrance. There may be a room that's been collapsed stone and you can't get into. Uh, but uh, with some fixing, it, you can survive in this space. Um, this is a 
house that, believe it or not, was survivable on the other end. The other end was a three-car garage, and they moved all the garage was came out fine. It seems like that was the only garage door I saw that didn't blow out first. But uh, as you can see, the, the tornado picked up the end of the building and then dropped it back down. And um, uh, I put my placard where the rain wouldn't get to it. But if you'll also notice, no brick ties, all the bricks laying on the ground. Now, uh, this, is, uh, this is University Place School here in Tuscaloosa. I designed it in, oh, let's see, 1990. I think we actually built it in 94. Um, and the, the lower floor that you see that's still there is poured and placed concrete walls, block walls, and uh, with rods, rods in uh, every fourth cell and, and it's solid concrete. The corridors are all solid concrete and then the floor for the second floor is 10 inch core slab with a two inch topping on top of that. It had almost no problems. The, the windows, well, the glass was broken out in the windows, but uh, the downstairs could have been used with, with some uh, what we call FEMA trailer uh, tarps. They could have gone back to using the school if they needed to. What happened was to, to the second floor is I'm gonna blame on value engineering. We, we were worried about how much it was gonna cost. And so we went through and we took out the the solid core, uh, solid concrete walls with, uh, excuse me, the concrete block walls with solid cores on the second floor and in, in the second floor corridor. The idea was the second floor corridor would be your disaster shelter. And we decided that we didn't need it on two floors. If there was a storm, they'd go downstairs. And I hope they did. Well, actually there was no one there that day, so that's, that wasn't a problem. But uh, we probably saved $40,000 out of a six million dollar school to go value engineer that out i i wish i really wish i'd had that one to come back um here's one there's another i'm telling stories because you know sometimes you don't think about how how close to home these things come this lady is an invalid she's a widow the, the storm picked her house up and then dropped it back down a tree also landed on the house and another tree knocked her electric service off. The insurance man came by, got out of his car, wrote her a check for $3,600 to fix the shingles on the roof and reconnect the electricity. He never noticed that the house had been moved off the foundation. And so I wrote her, uh, I wrote up the report for her and um, she called back and I'm, and I'm not sure where we're gonna go with this, but uh, the insurance company wanted to know if I knew what I was doing. And so I had to, I'm, I'm putting together photographs and, and a, a longer report to make, to make it work. But I'm sure the man didn't, didn't mean to do it to her, but on the other hand, he didn't spend much time. And if, if there's not somebody to look after people uh, who, you know, they, they know what's going on, you can really run into some problems. Uh, this is a yellow label. Again, it's, you have damage, but you're not at 50% damage. Um, and people see this, they kind of understand what's going on, but uh, it, it, it's more of just for help for, for like Alan. Um, when, it, when, when a contractor comes in and he says, I'm here to get a, get a permit to put shingles on the roof, and you find out that the roof is two blocks away from where the house is, you know there's more to it than, than, than just that. So if he has a yellow tag that says, and, a, and we turn in a report, the report says the roof is gone, then Alan knows it's not a $150 building permit and, and, and fixing broken glass. Um, again, a few just uh, signs. Trees falling on houses are most of the things we, we put yellow, uh, yellow on. Green says that you have some damage, but everything's safe. Um, people like those. In fact, there are a lot of people that have kept theirs up. If you ride around Tuscaloosa, the greens are still up there. The red ones, they, in fact, we had a little boy going down the street behind our crew pulling the red ones down. 
uh, again, green will also be a, like garage doors. I'm, uh, we're we're going to have to do something about getting garage doors made stronger. Uh, they seem to go out first, and when they do, so does everything else. And um, just my experience with this, um, once, uh, once the EMA director here called me, which I guess was about 11 o'clock uh, the night after the president left, uh, he said, okay, go see Alan Boswell, city chief building inspector, in the morning, telling me you're ready to do the inspections. And so I did. Alan looked at me like, you're going to do who, what, where? And uh, I said, yeah, we're, we're going to do the inspections. Uh, and let me say this right now. The biggest problem that, 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 that we've had providing free service like this is explaining that it's free and that we want to help. Because a lot of agencies, EMA uh, authorities, and there's one in every county, they're thinking their, their only source of help is going to be somebody that's going to charge them money. Uh, and, and that's our main reason for being here is to try to give back to the community. And so when we say we don't charge, they look at you like, and what planet are you from? So. But uh, Alan knew me, and uh, I appreciate that. I'll say that publicly, sir. You, you, you listened, and, and when, it, when the time came, um, Alan could have selected a, a, an out-of-state engineering firm to come in and do assessments for them for several dollars. I, I think it, that's fair to say. But uh, he let us go ahead and, and do the work. We had training. Let's see, that was on Thursday. We trained 200 people on Saturday, and then we let them go home because th that Sunday was Mother's Day, and started work Monday morning. Now, Alan's people, let me see if I've got some better pictures. Well, uh, Alan's people set us up with maps, and it, it, he, he sort of bounced across this, but uh, Al the uh, uh, city planning department has a GS, or GIS, is that what they call it? GIS system. And with the GIS system, they were able to give us blocks, city blocks and community uh, uh, block drawings showing where buildings had been. And believe me, it is not easy to find. I mean, I've lived here a long time. That You walk out there and you don't know where you are. You're looking for street signs and some places you can't find the street. Um, I, you know, I'd always heard that F4 and F5 meant everything was destroyed, and I guess that's true, but I didn't expect the debris. It, it was like, the, like walking around, like you're an ant walking around in a salad, uh, and, and the salad's made out of pine trees, and maybe somebody's carport, and, and, a, and, and the croutons are SUVs laying around in different places. Uh, it, it was very disorienting, uh, and with those maps we were able to, to go through, tag the buildings, mark them, write up a report, and, and get that information in back into to Alan's, Alan's people. Um, this is the picture of the, uh, uh, of the path of the tornado in Tuscaloosa. And we worked from the yellow to the, well, right, uh, left to right across, across through there. And in the process, well, we had 5,000, is that right? Was it 5,000 structures? A little over 5,000 structures. And we worked those guys. We had teams of uh, three to five people in a team. We had 12 to 15 teams every day, uh, and we rotated. Some people couldn't work a full, you know, uh, for, for days and days, but we asked them to, to give us three days in that period. And so uh, from Monday to Saturday afternoon, the following, we did over 5,000 buildings, and, and we had all the information in the computer by the first of the next week. And that included photographs, um, the uh, GIS information, and everything, so that within a couple of days, Alan was able to type in an address and pull up on, on the computer screen a picture that we had taken of the damage. So there was no question as to what the, what the contractor was going to be doing. Uh, this is a picture of the, uh, the training session. Um, 
<laughs> it was a room for what, I think uh, 80 people and we had 200 in there. And the state fire marshal or deputy fire marshal was standing in the back looking at the doors and counting heads. And he, he said, y'all just hang in here. And, but uh, we got the training over with and, and, and Alan gave us a tour around so they saw kind of what they were working on. Now the training that, that you get, um, what we well what we got there let me see if i can, got it in my pocket you'll wind up with a credit card looking device that is given out by the uh, california uh, valuation i guess you'll see this very whoops that's it laying down there this one finally came but it's a credit card looking thing but it's gay but it's photo id and with this, uh, we should be able to go to any kind of disaster, at least in the state of Alabama, present this and, and they'll know that we know what we're doing and, and can do uh, the reporting that they need. This training is based on some stuff that was put together by ATC, which is Advanced Tech, uh, I think that Applied Technology Council. Uh, applied Technology put together some training for California several years, like in the several years ago, late 80s, it was ATC-20, it was their first training manual and it was for earthquakes. Well, that's been modified, modified, and finally, we got around to uh, uh, needing something for wind and water, and that's ATC-45. Um, you're, uh, if, if you see somebody with one of these, you know he's put up with a very boring in, uh, class, but hopefully they've been out there in the field and, and done some, some boots in, on the ground uh, inspections. Uh, we set up, a, in, in, as Alan said, the uh, city was moving, which was kind of, uh, the in, inspection department was moving, so they had empty spaces up in City Hall. So we just set up some tables, got a couple of computers, hooked up a telephone line, and had a, uh, a, a collection point so that every morning our people came in, got their plans, uh, maps, and a uh, stack of signs, a roll of duct tape, everybody has to have duct tape, and, uh, and went out and usually we would do a morning and an afternoon uh, uh, loop and uh, covered a lot of territory. Alan also got some badges put together and word of warning, you want badges numbered, you don't want your name on there because people get hostile sometimes and they don't like, to, they, you don't want them to know what your name was. Um, these are some more pictures around. We had boxes of placards, helmets, uh, all kinds of things. And in the process, we came across some ideas and, and uh, I noticed there's a picture of a young man in, in, the, in the car. One, one team just had a guy who sat and entered the information for the GIS information on, on the, uh, uh, each, each piece of property. And um, it, it worked very, very fast. And, and something that, uh, that we've, that's happened since then is that uh, this, is, this is a smartphone. It's not an Apple, but it's, uh, it's an Android. And FEMA, has, uh, is coming out with an application for this that'll soon be, on, be available that when you take a picture with this, you'll know what your GIS coordinates are. You can dictate into it and that'll go back, assuming that the telephone's working, it'll go back in real time back to a uh, collection point where it'll, it'll be typed out and printed out and become part of a permanent record. If they don't have a, uh, a per permanent setup, then it, the GIS still works and you just keep it in the memory card till you get back to the, uh, to the center. This is a picture of, of what the printout looked like. If you can see, um, this is Forest Lake here. Uh, my school would have been right about over here on the other side of Forest Lake. And I helped a lady, this green spot right here, it's a, a little story. She uh, she had a tree on her house, and it was very little damage, and so she hired an out-of-town contractor. The guy was a good contractor, and I'm sure he's he's going to do a good job, but he wasn't too familiar with building codes, and so 
once he got a building permit, he went in there and basically tore down the house so he could build it back. And when he did, he invoked all of the current building codes and, and zoning ordinances. And all of a sudden, they found out or discovered quickly that she was eight feet into the set, whoops, excuse me, into the setback area, and um, didn't have any of the, uh, the 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 things that you'd like to see in a new new building. Ninety mile an hour winds. Uh, I, I know that it didn't blow away, but uh, uh, I don't think the building would have met our regulations even for minimums. Um, I was going to talk about roofs, but I think we kind of talked about roofs today. Uh, you really don't want to let those things get away from you. Uh, and this is, um, you know, just some more statistics, damages. Uh, and as the man said earlier, uh, there are a lot of buildings out there that we can save. I, don't, I would hate to have been in the direct path of that thing. Um, it, it, it's hard to be survivable in any of that. Um, lessons learned. Um, we, I guess we're sort of beating on this one again. Be prepared. Uh, I would never have been able to have organized this and, and gotten everybody together if Allen hadn't been organized, if the EMA here had not been ready, if AIA National had not backed me up with trainers, and if, uh, if we hadn't had more uh, more people in our area willing to understand that this is a disaster and, and we need to get in and, and do some work. Um, part of these things are that uh, our certifications don't last forever, so you have to keep on uh, getting people certified. And unfortunately, we were able to get a whole lot more people certified in front of uh, um, the um, the day, a week after a disaster than we were before a disaster. And in fact, it's kind of funny. Mobile has tornadoes, excuse me, and hurricanes all the time, but we, we didn't have as many people come up from Mobile to, to do the work. But, but the folks that showed up were definitely in areas where they had seen the damage. Um, t testing your action plan, part of what we're trying to get to happen now is to work with, this, with this, the EMA people in the state of Alabama to have our people meet and, and work with them on a regular basis. The next thing is probably an earthquake. We, we, we can have those, uh, especially uh, from Tuscaloosa North. Uh, we're, in, we're in a pretty good earthquake zone. Uh, and if that doesn't happen, I'm sure we'll get a hurricane soon. So uh, there'll be time to to, to get people trained and, and bring them up. But uh, design and inspect new buildings to handle disasters. Uh, that's, that's an issue that, that we really, I think we're all talking about today and to just how far can we go and how much can we afford. Uh, here's a, some, some more s examples. This was a picture, I, I wanted to take some pictures just to, to talk about and uh, this, when I saw this wall, I, it, it, when you, you're up against it, right beside it, it's, it's obvious. This thing was bent, racked, turned every which way, and I thought, my goodness, you know, how, how did it even manage to stand up? But then when you get to looking at it, and I don't know if you can see this very well, but I've blown it up a little to the right, or to the left, to the left side. There's, there's no concrete on those rebars. They, they, they ran the rebar horizontally, but they only fill the cells at the corners. And this is the wall. Uh, again, at the bottom, I've blown up. It looks like they did the, they put the rebars in the, in the, in the, in the footing by drilling, because there's only about four inches of rebar that just basically pulled out of the ground. Uh, the door actually held up pretty well. It didn't blow out, which is what I would have expected. That building is was built just about to, uh, about 1995, maybe six. Uh, of course, this is a well-built roof deck. It just didn't 
get tied into the rest of the house. Again, we've seen this one. Uh, if the roof had stayed on this building, it probably wouldn't be a, a grassy field right now. Uh, this is my school again. This was the other end of the building that was also value engineered. One of the value engineering steps here was to build this uh, section of the building with metal building components rather than uh, poured in place concrete and, and concrete block. Um, in this case, the wind, there was a kitchen on the back side and the loading dock at the kitchen had a, a soft ceiling. The ceiling blew out and it looks like the, uh, the air came in from that side and basically lifted the roof off. And once the, the roof went off, the end wall blew out and, and the walls on both ends of, of that area were lost. This is the other end. Again, we, we talked about this one. Um, the, uh, the corridor down below was solid and the corridor up above was uh, studs and, and some concrete block. Uh, Okay, this is, this is also on that same school on the other end. I uh, don't have a, a, a further picture out, I wish I had. This was a gym we put over there about three years ago. This gym is built out of metal building components, but the exterior skin is SIP panels, uh, structural insulated panels. It's, uh, th this particular one, the roof and the walls are three inch thick, urethane foam, 26 gauge steel, inside and out. Um, a tree went through a door right behind this, the tree you see in the picture and uh, took out the door, but the building didn't explode. It was put together well uh, and we watched it closely and, and I was mostly worried about energy conservation, but we sealed all the cracks and all the holes with foam, anything that uh, we couldn't cover with uh, sheet metal and screws was uh, taken care of. and so. The result was the, um, the gutters were knocked off. So the edges of the roof took some, some abuse from missiles, but um, no damage on the inside. And this is the other side of that same building. Uh, it was all glass, and because of the way the building was, the wind came in, the glass didn't, didn't break. Now, you'd think, well, maybe the winds weren't very high there, but you can see what it did to the school beside it and the church on the other side uh, lost its roof, steeple, and all the windows and doors. This is something that, uh, this is the drawing for a church that we're doing south of here. Uh, and in this case, you, the, the primary reason for you seeing this is uh, the little dotted lines. Those are uh, banding, strapping, uh, that we're, re we're requiring the contractor install. Um, it's inch and three quarter wide, 26 gauge steel, and if you're familiar with metal buildings, you know that they, they, this metal comes in coils. Well, when metal building companies are, are, pour, are making their roof and wall panels, they have to cut those things to, down to size, and so there's always a little trim strip left over. So you can get that material for 50, 40, 50 cents a pound, and a pound of 26 gauge will go 18 feet, uh, a pound of 24 gauge will go 15 feet. So it's not expensive and it's easy to put, put on the side of the building. And it, what we're requiring contractor is screw and glue and connect to the, the, the trusses and to the foundation. Now, that's a poor man's solution, but Simpson obviously has got, a good, got some good products too. Uh, just another picture of uh, what you, what you didn't expect to come through the wall. I, the one on the left is going in and the, on the right is coming out. Uh, that's a one by eight and, and, uh, and we saw that everywhere. I mean, th this is just something that's just this normal. I talked to a lady uh, who was over on Crescent Ridge Road. She was holding on to her daughter. She and her husband and daughter were in the bathroom. When it was over with, the bathroom tub was still there and she was holding her daughter and her daughter's shoes were gone but she was talking about how dark it was. She couldn't see a thing. It was totally filthy. There was everything going past. And she, the, there were 16 people uh, in, around her that she, she pointed out that, that aren't here now, neighbors or, or people. There were two bodies in her front yard. Uh, she was just plain lucky. You know, you think about 
wind speed and being able to survive pressures, but when a two by six hits you, or two by four, it, it's, it, you know, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. So we need to talk about security, secure areas in, in any home and underground if you can. Um, this is a, just a, a, a picture recently in, in Forest Lake. It's coming back, but it, that was, uh, I think as Alan said, it, it, it was full of trees before this. Now it's just a big open, you, it looks like Kansas. And those things won't happen again. When I, I started helping the lady and she wanted to put her house back the way it was, and I said, ma'am, we've got to take nine feet off the end of it to make it fit. And your, your garage is not gonna be able to be here, we're gonna put it over there. And she sits down and she starts drawing things and, and she said, now this is my dressing table, this is where I put my comb and this is where I put my jewelry box. She's 87 years old. It's hard for her to go to another, to go live in a motel, let alone give up her trees and all those other things. So I, I think we need to, and, and all of y'all are involved in this, you need to have some compassion for these people. They, this is their life, and when you change it, uh, you, 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 <laughs> you, in this case, you, you're gonna bring somebody on, you, on your back, because she was upset. Uh, and, and of course she was mad because the storm had done the damage and her contractor had done, done more damage by, by trying to fix it the, the right way. And yet she has to bear the brunt of it. Uh, this is another building right up the street from her um, that uh, it's a um, Masonic Lodge. The, 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 the lodge wanted to just rebuild but uh, because it was a more than 50% damaged they have to meet the new city ordinances for landscaping. Well, the only thing that was left of any value was the parking lot. And it's too close to the city streets and to the property line. So in order to uh, make that work, we had to dig up the parking lot and we're gonna put in um, green areas all the way around the building. That's one expense that the insurance company didn't cover. Another problem is that because we made the parking lot smaller, then the building footprint had to get smaller. So their one-story building is now going to be a two-story building. So those are just things you don't expect to happen. It's hard enough to rebuild, but then that building's been there since 1960. So it, it's probably seen some good times anyway. Um, so just to recap, we had to get a Good Samaritan law to work, and we have one now. We think it's, it's a lot better than it's ever been. We're trying to get a, an architect in every area to connect with, a local EM, with the local EMAs so that they know who we are and what we're doing. Um, I guess y'all saw what we did in, in the assessment thing. I'll, I'll say that I think our architects, the ones that did the surveys, are better for what we did. They saw and learned a whole lot, and and we're going to try to pass along some more of these uh, good ideas. Hopefully, some things I've heard today are, will make uh, make good information to be sending out. And we're gonna, we have to have continuing education anyway. This is a good place to start. And of course, we've covered these lessons and observations. Thank you very much.